Hey y'all, Michael Martin here, host of Creative Bear Hug, and today I'm speaking with painter Jared Friedman. Intending to work as a commercial designer after graduating from the Massachusetts College of Art and Design in Boston, Jared quickly found himself at odds with his plans as his passion for painting and fine art called his name. Determined to spend his time in proximity with the art he loved, Jared began working in galleries, museums, and assisting in art studios while devoting his free time to painting and building his own portfolio. For 10 years, Jared continued to paint, and although satisfied with both the growing quantity and quality of his work, his enthusiasm waned as the natural limits of his ability to progress on his own became apparent. Looking for a path that would nurture his momentum, Jared decided to enroll in the MFA program at Hunter College in New York, where now, in the throes of his second year, he spends almost all of his waking hours either painting in his studio or engaging in the intense regimen of immersive education and peer critique prescribed by the program. In our conversation, Jared speaks about how criticism has helped him grow as an artist, the benefits of working in an intense creative environment, and how he strives to uncover the interesting within the uninteresting in his paintings. Jared was kind enough to invite me to a studio in Manhattan which overlooks a busy street, so apologies for all the honking and sirens. Our conversation begins with Jared explaining what drew him to this MFA program in the first place. I didn't realize how important people were <laughs> like to talk to them about your work. Yeah, I yeah. was making paintings by myself in my room and showing them to people online or people who wanted to come to my apartment to look at them, you know, but you can't really invite like galleries to your apartment necessarily. Um, you can, but like, it was more of like, yeah, just wanting to like think deeper about the work. And I, ju I guess it was just, I was ready, I, you know, when I was like 31, maybe 30, I was like, finally, I want to try to apply and see what happens. Well, that kind of leads me to the question I wanted to ask earlier. The, what I'm interested about being in this kind of setting is that there is this ecosystem of critique. I mean, yeah. that's part of the the growing process, right? You have access to people who are working on their own things and can come in and give their opinion from a quote unquote educated or kind of experienced background. Um, mm. When you first were exposed to that, was that difficult or uh, scary? Yeah, it was weird. Well, I just wasn't used to it. Yeah. And also, that's another thing about illustrate, like communication design or whatever you want to call it. illustration critiques are different than, you know, fine art critiques. It's more of a, it's more illustration. And cause I come from the commercial world, I guess, if you want to call it that is like, yeah. you know, talking about what is, is this communicating like a short story idea or an editorial, like the client wants you to use blue. So you didn't right. use blue. What the, you know, it's like bullshit like mm -hmm. that, that I was, even that, as a young age, I was turned off by that. Sure. But yeah. now... and Because it's, like, inherently commercial, right? It's, like, you yeah, need so to... Yeah, so you have different conversations. Hit a mark. Yeah. You, you have way different conversations about the work. And now, what I love... Fine. Fine. Don't worry. Okay, cool. What I love <laughs> is... Uh, maybe I just was, like, a... I was a very literal kid. I still am a very literal person. Mm. But I, I wasn't ready to have, like, deep dive conversations into, like you know, interpreting a, an abstract work. And now I, I love it. And I'm, I think it, you know, getting an MFA at least, you know, I'm a year in it, a year and a half in it, it does make you think differently about like the world. And I, I also needed language to put to my work and right. being able to speak about it. And that's yeah. a hugely important part. And those skills you learned in th this environment. I mean, I, Yes, but also just that you need, uh, I wasn't talking about the work in the way and I sure. wasn't, um, in that way and I wasn't ready, um, to talk about it. I, that's the other thing is like, I knew what I was doing. I was, you know, I, I was proud to show people and I wanted to show people, but like, that's kind of half the battle is like, okay, then what, now what, how do you, yeah, like, what, right. what are you going to say about it? And like, what does it mean? And like I didn't know exactly what I knew there's like some subconscious thing or like an intuitive uh, level of what I do where I know what I want to see in a painting and make the painting but then you know it's like is that enough and then it's you know it's like what is the context around it but anyway yeah like critiques were uh I mean it's daunting too yeah I was nervous it's like I was like not I was so uh I was out of school for a while so 
my first critique, I was, I remember being so nervous. I was like in this painting class with a lot of really great painters who I had known their work. And that was part of the reason why I wanted to come to Hunter. And I was, mm. uh, it was a enlightening experience and it was all very lovely. And again, like a community of painters, you know, we knew, know what we're doing. Uh, we know what everyone's doing and it's, it's a good conversation. Um, it's an interesting conversation to have. And you just talk about like, what's better than that? Like talking about paintings for like the whole day. Yeah. I, I mean, it's exhausting, but it's like part of the reason I like doing this is because I, I just enjoy, I think I'm so, uh, like maniacal when it comes to anything great. I think my whole life has been dictated by this phantom itch to make stuff mm -hmm. and I, I enjoy talking to other people about it to the point where I could, I mean, I could do this all day. Uh, what I'm curious about is Same. this idea of confidence. Um, I mean, I, I weirdly enough, I, I think it was during the pandemic that when I made the switch between music and writing, I read so much that I gained this sense of confidence, not in so much that I thought my work was good, but I think I had read so many different authors and so many different books from so many different styles mm -hmm. that I recently like finished a draft and sent it to a bunch of people. And this is like very new to me. Um, I've never done anything like that before. Um, like with my music, I would just put it out and mm -hmm. you know, that was it. Uh, and I got feedback and this was one of the first times that having gotten feedback, I took it um, productively. <laughs> for lack of a better term. Yeah. It was um, where I think in m maybe my less experienced days, it would have either uh, devastated me. I mean, I would have been, you know, hitting my head against the wall or I would have been like, fuck you, you know, and been kind of immature about it. So I, I'm curious, like for you. That's a good skill to learn and to be able to, you know, take criticism. That's yeah. How, how, how did you experience that? And I mean, do you think it's a sense of confidence now or is it just a general, I mean, I, I have confidence in some of my work, but I'm, I'm very lacking in that, but it, 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 it knocks you down a peg when you come to a place like this with like amazing artists. Um, but the, but that's good. I think like, I don't think I'm like, I always say like, I probably made some good paintings, but like for someone to be like, I made a great painting. It's like, mm, nah, there's great paintings in like the Met, but like, I'll get there maybe, but it's like, I'm not going to say I'm making this great work. And that, if you don't really have like critique or like a group of like everyone around me and at Hunter is so like amazing and like, just like they're going to, they're the next, you know, generation of amazing artists. Right. Mm. And I feel like I'm thankful to be here and very lucky to be a part of it. But I guess it's like, I've always worked in some form of like, well, I guess like working in an art studio, um, the level of criticism was really intense. So like, I didn't really have an option to feel that it wasn't about my work, but I, I was criticized like every day at work for like certain like colors not matching. And in a way it's just like, you have to take the criticism and people would, if it's not done right, you just do it again. And um, I never experienced that with my work though, until I, you know, came here, but I guess I'm okay with it. Now. So in that uh, job that you were doing, you were getting yelled at and they were like, <laughs> yeah. So it was, it was like intense. It was intense and it just kind of, maybe that was also, and then even like at other jobs like the Brooklyn Museum or I guess I would just learn how to take criticism in a constructive way, even mm. um, again, something as meaningless as like standing in a gallery and it's not meaningless, but it's, you know, it's not connected to it's, I understand that though. It's hard when someone is going to criticize your, like, like your work is an extension of you and a personalized kind of, Thing. So I understand that people will get emotional about it. And in a way, a lot of my work maybe is dealing with that too, is like there's distance I'm creating between me and the painting and the subject matter and the viewer. Like there's definitely a distance that I'm including in the work. And I don't know what that says about mm, going around. I guess I'm, I guess I never thought of if someone has an 
issue with a part of the painting i'm always interested to hear it it's not like right. I, I don't f feel like right. that's a bad thing yeah obviously there is also the other thing is that everyone who comes here it's like a like a finishing degree like not a finishing degree but you know what you're making it's about tweaking and focusing and taking what people are saying with a grain of salt and take mm. what you need from it you don't have to take all of it from a right. critique um but it's skill nonetheless i think to be able to hear something about your work yeah it's not easy but it's like yeah. i don't i also don't mind it it's not i actually rather have but then the other flip side of it is someone is not telling you the truth and it's too yeah. nice that's also like hard I find that more frustrating. It's more frustrating. Yeah. I, I, like I said recently, and I, I mean, I love everybody that I sent my work to, but I've noticed like through the years, I mean, there are certain people that um, I ask to look at my work, whatever it is. And it's not, I mean, I, again, like I appreciate it. I think they, they say nice things. It's encouraging in a sense. Um, but sometimes I, yeah, it's like, I want somebody to say something, not so much negative, but constructive, you know, because I, mm -hmm. I want to know what I can't see. Yeah. I think it's all beneficial. Like, it's like, that's what I was missing these like 10 years or whatever. And then also you're going to be making what you do anyway, in a way right. you don't have to listen to anyone, but it's like, uh, it's helpful to, he yeah, exactly. It's also, it's just like everyone's coming from a different place. Right. They have different life experiences. That's a part of critique too, is that, you know, that's makes you better artists. It's like, why would you want to have these blind, you're always going to have blind spots in life and like, right. you can only try as hard as you can, but then obviously well someone is going to, it's it's more of this like group also it's like everyone's brilliant like they're gonna give you sh stuff that you can use well that, i mean that in a sense is like uh experience versus education right i mean you have somebody telling you something mm -hmm. from their own background and own perspective right. that you can actually use right and utilize as if you would like any other tool where it, you know when you read a book or you read about history you read about other artists going through it there is still kind of a disconnect um mm -hmm. in terms of what you can pull and like utilize in your own work yeah i mean again it's like i think that grad school is different um at least grad school like an mfa program is it's academia but there's that community side of it and not to always talk about california but like <laughs> all the the bay area figurative movement or whatever you'd like to call it came out of art school like that's the difference between california too is that what i'm learning is um all the innovation and like experimental shit came from the art schools because mm. it was like this structure of you know like um uc schools and um, there was like more of an implementation and also some of the, you know, best artists or however you want to phrase it to this day are all like, like look at the faculty of like UCLA right now. It's like the top name, you know, contemporary artists. So there's this level of, um, you know, like there's experimentation in academia there that then like, you know, pushing against abstract expressionism, this like figurative movement came out of these teachers from like, uh, like Cal Arts, I think, or SFAI, or, or uh, mm. and and that that's something that I didn't realize. And that, you know, they had their own way of working. But that's, you know, um, that's why art school is like was kind of what I was thinking. I wasn't. I don't know if I could go back to school to be a doctor or something. I yeah. think it's too late for that, but that's commendable too. So, w what's the program schedule like here? What's your like week look like? Um, oh, this one. So, yeah, the reason why I wanted to come here is because I guess there's like somewhat of an, there's a lot of like painters that I really loved here. And the, the schedule is, um, I guess you start out with a seminar class, which is like a required class, and then a tutorial, which is like a one on one. So you could study with a teacher of your choice. Oh, cool. And it was like a studio visit every week or every other week. But the seminars are with not only for me, like not only painters, but people who are working, you know, in a variety of medium media. So it's like, you know, you'd be in class with like 
performance artist, you know, sculpture artist, painter. So that's actually a huge um, thing. Like I almost went to a painting specific program, which would have been great. But in a way, I don't know if that would have helped. And like, I love being around painters and talking about painting, but this program is also heavily um, influenced or like utilizing like new media techniques and mm -hmm. like video art. And there's a lot of, I love, you know, filmmaking. So there's some of that. So you're with everyone making every different, you know, type of art you could think of. And that's helpful is to like have an open-ended critique or a conversation about everything. And that's something that I, that's just like an added bonus. Like I was not expecting like that, that expands your, you know, viewpoint exponentially. It's really interesting. I think cause what I find speaking to some artists is that they choose a medium, but really they're just trying to speak in a language. They find the medium that works for them and they're just trying to say what they want to say, whether they know what it is or not. Right. Uh, painting seems to be your thing, but it's interesting that you say what you just said, because I mean, I find the same thing. Like when I write, when, when I'm writing, I read a time, I mean, I read like a book a week. That's like my way of keeping the engine, you know, nice. put the coal in the engine, keep the train going. Um, but you know, I think also like I consume a lot of, like I watch television, I watch movies, I listen to music. And I love going to the museum because you never know what you're going to see or hear or whatever that will spark that next thing. And I think part of the reason why I was so intrigued to speak with other people was seeing what other artists or creatives do to keep that spark alive and keep that inspiration going. Because there are kind of dark, darker periods where... Yeah, it could on. be very... I mean... I guess also what we're also saying is like going to your studio alone is in a room. Some people don't have windows in there, you know, it's, like, yeah. it's a little bit, uh, it's not what everyone does at work or like, it's pretty lonely and maybe it means like you don't hang out or see some people. So it's a very solitary confining place. So to have not only like fellow painters, but everyone around like that's, almost necessary i need studio visits like this right now like, this is good like to talk and like expand yeah. what you do but the thing about this program in particular is like i wasn't you should be able to speak to again what you're saying is like work that you would not make or that you appreciate yeah and i hope i'm good at that or getting better is like you know you can also be like i really dig this you know video or something i would never attempt to make this or i know what i could do or can't do but I can talk about it. And that's what the critiques at like the studio art programs are good as like that kind of um, thing. And also like being in New York, it's like, there's an emphasis on, uh, you know, there's always amazing shows around. You got to see everything. Yeah. It's sometimes exhausting and daunting to go to all these openings, but uh, that's like also a part of the education. And I try to, it's like equally as almost as important as like going to the studio every day. It's like way, way too much. Run me through in detail, like a typical day of when you would be painting. Mondays, 12, oh, like a typical day. If I had the full day, I would probably come in to the studio. Start, I, start from like the moment you wake up. Yeah, I'd probably, you know, have a and cup where, where of coffee. Do you live? I live in Greenpoint. Okay. So I have a cup of coffee. What would, what would it be? You I sorry, just to clarify for anybody who doesn't know yeah. green points in Brooklyn, which is about what? 45 minutes away from your studio. Yeah. I mean, that's a good By train, right? point too, is that 45 minutes to sometimes an hour if I don't get the right train or yeah. I mean, I, there's a, I have to take two trains. So what time do you wake up? I'll try to wake up at nine or 10 and then read a little bit with some coffee. M maybe okay. I have all these books going about, you know, certain painters that I like, or just, that also helps is like knowing what other people are doing. So these are books related to the program or just? No, on my own. Okay. I mean, yeah, there's other things I have to read like in the middle of the week. But um, and then I would just either bike to work if it's nice. I mean, bike to the studio across mm -hmm. the bridge, which is probably faster. Yeah. Or what I'm learning is that my subway commute is all since it's so long that I'll read, mm -hmm. which is great. Or I mostly keep a sketchbook and I've been drawing like tons on the subway. Oh, cool. Yeah. So that nice. actually, 
And another point is then either coming to the studio or leaving the studio, I will think more or sketch more, but I'll be thinking about what I want to be doing here, mm. which is also something that you don't get if you're like rolling out of bed and then painting in your bedroom. Right. So it's like a mental preparation. Yeah. I mean, str like stretching, I guess you might say. Mm -hmm. um, so you get on the train in this case. I have tons of, I could show you all my sketchbooks yeah. of like drawing like the subway bars. I love that shit. Like I that, saw some of your paintings. There's one of, I think it's like the six train or one of those trains with the three uh, multicolored seats. Yeah. And it's kind of abstract. I can I, show I really you like yeah. that one. Thanks. I mean, it's, that's also maybe appearing in my work. Cause it's like, I spent so much time right. coming here. And that's the other thing is like, if I'm going to spend an hour getting here, I need to at least come, you know, like stay here for eight hours or something. So you get on the train, you come here, Typical so, Monday, what yeah, happens? Just get to work and I just go back into a painting I'm already working on or I will prepare at the same time a new work. So I stretch my own canvas. I'll build the stretcher bars, prime it with gesso and leave it. And then, so there's a bunch of things I could be doing. Um, it's mostly just coming here and kind of, you know, getting to work. I think, yeah, it, you right. know, it's it's... It's not really anything, uh, it's just like putting in the work really. I mean, yeah. Alex Katz had a good thing where he's just like, he would also sketch on the subway a lot. And I, you know, he's like 90 something and still doing it. Mm -hmm. um, I guess the subway prepares me mentally for it. I'm thinking about what I want to do, but also like, you know, actually just like drawing from observation and what we were right. talking about earlier was important to do that every day. And that's like, yeah, I do that every day, mostly. And then um, uh, you get here and you get to work. And yeah. is it a sustained period of time that you're engaged in your work? Well, the example of like Monday, if I'm starting to paint at 1230 p.m. after some lunch or something, I'll stay. I'll just paint for eight hours. So the next thing I'll know will be like 930 okay. uh, or, you know, and that's. I always try to say like, I got to leave, you know, to get home to eat dinner and stuff, but I usually just end up staying and it's hard to, time works differently here. So you just like, next thing you know, it's like, you know, dark out and it's, it's kind of weird. So you find more often than not, you get lost oh, after yeah. you come here? Okay. Well, Alex Katz also said something where it's like, you need at least six to eight hours every day in the studio if you want to be like, you know, professional artist, but... I understand that. And it is true. It's just like, there are some days when you get here and you're like, fuck, what do I do? Or like, you just stretch a canvas and prime it and they're not like getting anything done, but you're, well, you're getting something done. It's a part of the work, but you're not, yeah. you know, finishing something, but that's also a part of it. Sometimes you might be frustrated and work for eight hours and realize what you did was complete shit and you have to paint over it the next day. That happens all the time. You hopefully get to a stopping point. You don't feel like an asshole for leaving. But you, I feel I feel like that a bit. And then um, what helps is if I take a photo and then I'll be looking at it through a screen on the on the subway, which helps in many instances of composition or realizing what you need to do tomorrow. Yeah. So you're always in it. I mean, it's I don't know. I guess so. But you try to once you finish a work, you you know, it's out of your hands and I rarely go back into an old piece. So are you happy with the way that you're like, you come here, you work all day, you go home on the subway, you're still engaged in it. I mean, what I, what I mean to say is for me, what I've learned is that I have found a rhythm in that I have a part-time job and the days that I do the part-time job, I don't do anything creative. I mean, that, it, that is it, a good schedule. It's yeah. always nipping at my heels, and sometimes I give in a little bit, but for well, the most part, I, I try to separate. Yeah, no, that's things. really, uh, yeah, that's a good point, is that uh, I guess I should have mentioned, like, Wednesdays and Thursdays, even, well, I read for my class up until Thursday evening, and that involves writing, like, a response to the reading. Mm. So those days I'm, I have to. There are, that's a good point. Cause like there are days you have to be like, I'm not coming to the studio. And those are maybe Wednesdays and Thursdays and Fridays and some Saturdays. Uh, 
So you do consider that? Oh yeah, that's something that I, like last semester I was saying I was working way too much, making all this work. And that's also like, I wasn't thinking, you need time to finish up work and then think about what you just did. Cause then I'll just be an autopilot making what I know I could make, but I'm not thinking about how, like what, cause when you make a piece, hopefully it evolves and then you like, like it should be in dialogue with your most recent work is like, how do I keep on pushing the work forward? But if you're like so burnt out and constantly making stuff, you're not thinking about that in the right way. So yeah, that's a great point. Also to, to remove yourself from always being on in the studio and jo a job helps with scheduling yeah. a part-time job or whatever. Uh, I, also yeah. s I, I mean, one thing that I do, I don't know if you do this or I've ever considered doing this is I schedule breaks. Um, I'll like, Shit, work, I need to do that. Yeah. I'll work for an hour and then I'll go for a 15 minute walk. Um, I learned that pretty early on actually in school. There was a, um, seminar that I attended and, um, I've said this on a previous thing, but the guy was like the, the most important thing that you can do is take a 15 minute break. Cause it seems like maybe you and I are the same in that when you get into that groove, nothing else matters. I mean, your brain is so focused on one thing that you get lost. And I find that if something is not working, like you mm -hmm. mentioned, sometimes like you come here, you don't know what you're doing, or you've been working on something for eight hours and it turns out to be shit. Mm -hmm. I get, uh, you know, very critical and will take it out on myself and start kind of berating myself. Yeah. That's a tough um, thing. Yeah, that's smart. I'm, I need to be better at that. I'm the wrong, I'm like not dealing with any of this properly. It's all very, I've like a lot of neuroses as well. And like, um, it's, yeah, it's difficult, but it's, um, you know, it doesn't seem like you really have a choice. No, but it's, <laughs> but you're right. It's like slowing down. I need, you know, just slowing down, uh, just being okay with like what you did before and like realizing that slowing down doesn't mean they're not as productive or whatever. Um, but yeah, there'd be times when like, I don't even want to like leave to go to the bathroom. You know, it's like, I, I got to pee really badly, but I got to finish this part. Yeah, and that's yeah. just dumb. And like, you know, take stepping back is also great. Uh, I'm doing more of that this, these days. So that, that does help. And to know that you don't have to be on and productive every day and that realize like that's that's also like as important as working is you need like time to like process it all like so is this your final year i have one more year and it's just it's gonna okay. get even worse so okay <laughs> it's okay. gonna there's one again it's like i mean i hope you'll come to my thesis show there's yeah, gonna be a, love to. a big show like it's like a group show of five people but it's like you're that's the end goal is you write a paper and then you put together a large show, a group show downstairs in the gallery on like Hudson and I mean Canal. And uh, yeah, that's like the ending of it all. And then from there, we'll see what happens. Yeah, I wonder, I mean, you're, you're clearly in the thick of it, but I wonder what you might take away in terms of like working habits when you leave here and start when you don't have this environment that's sucking you in and making holding you accountable. Yeah, it's the structure is like, that's what you were alluding to is like this, that's also maybe what you pay for in a way. It's like the structure of right. the place. And you could get that structure in many different instances. What is- You what, think it was important for you to be held accountable by somebody else rather than be held accountable I probably do. It goes back to me needing to rebel against like an art director or something. Yeah, the structure is probably in- important to be held accountable there are other ways you could do it but i'm not the best like it seems like you're good at scheduling and maintaining your time or you learned how to do it over the course of a while but that structure yeah i mean yeah to be held accountable to work towards a critique like i have i'm going to make three big paintings by april like to have also i mean a lot of people from the program will get shows after so they'll be you know forced to make six paintings by like a couple months or whatever that scheduling is important deadlines are important to light a fire under your ass yeah but also to leave the program what what stays in place is the the people and everyone mostly stays in new york and you have this built-in you know set of people who you can always ask questions and they're also in the same boat and they all get studio space 
so you're all ready in it and yeah it's gonna be like the same maybe less reading i don't know yeah do you ever think about your legacy when you're working (laughs) no but i mean (laughs) well it's that when you make an object like if you consider painting an object like at least you're leaving that behind um i think of people like i don't think of that no i don't i don't think they're I guess it's like also goes back to the concept of like painting like common objects or everyday banal shit is that the point is that they're not important, but then that if an alien, you know, race finds us in the future, they would think this is, I guess it's like Um, elevating the banal, right? So it's like the uninteresting, like these are in a way uninteresting paintings, like that's what I want, but they're the way that it's, you know, painted, I hope is. I guess it's like finding the interesting aspects of an uninteresting thing. And that's, you know, I don't know what that means, but yeah, yeah, that's, that's a part of it. That's all a part of it. I hope that it's more of a documentation of like, mm, I mean like Pepper, I remember Arya told me Pepper, uh, where people would see things in life and then be like, Jared would paint that. That's what I hope Mm. is my legacy. Oh, interesting. It's like, look at this corner. This shadow underneath the seat, ooh, or like, look at this pipe. Like upstairs, I installed all these fake pipes <laughs> coming off of the real pipes. So in a way, it's like, I don't want you to really even know it's there, but if you're paying attention close enough, uh, then that's uh, fine by me. Like I want I want you to look closer, you know? Like that's, maybe that's another good point of legacy is like, if people are just like looking closer at you know, the subway station they're in every day, that's, uh, that's good enough for me. Thanks for listening to this episode of Creative Bear Hug. If you'd like to listen to the second part of our conversation or just want to support the show, please consider becoming a Patreon supporter. For only $5 a month, you can help me keep the show going as well as gain access to all the bonus episodes, which are dedicated to delving further into my guest backgrounds, as well as learning about their passion and obsessions. In this bonus episode, Jared outlines his biography where he talks about how rebellion helped him discover his artistic identity as a child, to what it was like working security in a museum as well as the harsh environment he experienced as a studio assistant. See you on the other side. Cheers.